just delighted to be here with you. Thank you, John, very much for the invitation. And it's a thrill for me to share the stage with this incredible group of accomplished women that I'll introduce to you in just a minute. We're here today celebrating the new majority alliance of Asian, Latinx, black community, finding ways to work together and to build a future where we can all be successful. That's the idea of this new majority coalition. That's our goal and objective, but I think it's important to start with the present. Today in 2018, black, Latino, and Asian women are over a third of the female population in the United States. They're graduating from college in increasing numbers, and they're focusing on STEM more than ever before. At the undergraduate level, they're earning about 39% of all computer and information science degrees that go to women, 29% of the engineering degrees earned by women. At the graduate level in the past 20 years, women of color have more than doubled their share of science and engineering, masters and doctoral degrees and they earn proportionately more of those degrees than men of color. But if we look at the workplace overall, let's take the S&P 500. 500 of our biggest companies, women of color hold only 19% of all jobs and 5% of executive and senior jobs. And in the entire S&P 500, there are only two companies with women of color at the helm. Two out of 500. And when we focus on science and engineering jobs, we see that only 11% of employees are black, Hispanic, or Asian women. Various studies have shown that women of color in STEM experience a far different workplace than their colleagues who are not women of color including feeling unsafe at work and dealing with sexist and racist comments from both peers and supervisors. In two weeks, Catalyst is going to release new research describing a major factor in how women and men of color experience the workplace. What we found is that when people of color feel different or like an other, at work because of their gender, race, and or ethnicity, they tend to live in a state of vigilance against racial and gender bias. They're constantly on guard against small things, like offhand remarks about their appearance or assumptions about their ability, and against bigger things, like opportunities not offered and support not given. Day in, day out, they are bracing for results, avoiding social interactions and places, and adjusting their appearance to protect against hurtful situations. All of this adds up to what we call the emotional tax that can have heavy personal consequences affecting engagement at work and sleep at night. And it doesn't just harm those employees, it's detrimental to business too, since employees who can't thrive can't do their best work and may ultimately choose to leave the companies that they work for. Now I'm looking around this room and I see many of you nodding. I think you know exactly what I'm talking about. And you're not alone. Our lead researcher on this project, Dr. Tanika Travis, spoke on this topic in research a few months ago to an audience of primarily black employees at a major corporation. At the end of the talk, she did a quick poll and asked the people in the room if they too had experienced the emotional tax. And so Danica would probably shudder at the thought of me doing research, but I'm gonna ask the same question. Does this resonate for you and have you experienced the emotional tax? Just a show of hands. Many of you raised your hand. And in fact, in this example that I gave you, what's interesting is that one of the white male directors on the board of directors of the company where she was giving this talk was so surprised to see how deeply held and how common this experience was 
that he approached Anika to try and learn more and understand about that research. So now let's zoom ahead to what we're talking about today, the new majority. And we'll zoom ahead to the year 2060. Women of color are the majority of all women in the United States. Instead of being what we often refer to as a double minority, women of color are a double majority. The wide range of systemic barriers that have historically combined to prevent them from achieving their maximum potential have been eradicated. Me Too and Black Lives Matter are held up exa as examples of social movements that have succeeded in creating real, lasting change to our culture. Catalysts no longer exist because we've achieved gender equality at work. And a little girl who was inspired by Oprah's 2018 Golden Globe speech has become the president. What does it look like in 2060? Many of you probably have a better idea than I do of the technology we'll be using, flying cars instead of self-driving cars. Innovative chips in our brains that activate our best ideas, or maybe robots will have taken over all our jobs and we'll all have more time for vacation. <laughs> Assuming that we all have jobs, I think that in 2060, our businesses will be places where people of all backgrounds are contributing their expertise and ideas, and they're being developed and promoted equitably. In these workplaces, Everyone is different, so no one is the other. At the same time, we all feel included on the team. We belong, each person bringing their unique skills, knowledge, and perspective to the table. I can be me, and you can be you, and we can all work together tackling the problems that we've been hired to solve. That's our goal. So if that's the future that awaits us and that we look to create, what do we need to do together to make it happen? There's a few things that I think are really critical. And the first is that we need leaders, CEOs like Ginny Romady, who has spearheaded an initiative at IBM that specifically prioritizes technical women's development sponsorship and advancement through intentional programs that support women and diverse talent. I'm so thrilled that IBM is winning the Catalyst Award um, in 2018 along with the Boston Consulting Group Nationwide and Northrop Grumman. And it's no surprise that two of our panelists today are women from IBM. So we need leaders to do their part. But as we look, to the issue of advancing women in STEM and creating that new culture and environment that we want, here's what we also know, is that women of color can't do this alone. We need leaders to step up from business, education, the political spheres to say, there are benefits for all of us if we have more women engaging as scientists, engineers, coders, medical staff, ensuring that the work of the future looks like the population of the future. And it's really important, frankly, that organizations like Catalyst, that advocate for women's advancement in business, ensure that our advocacy extends not only to white women, but to all women. And we need men to step forward and play your part. It is not your fault that women are underrepresented in leadership, but because you are the majority, it's your responsibility to do your part to make a difference. That's how we all need to acknowledge and express and embrace our own privilege and do our part. Today I am, as I said at the beginning, honored to have the opportunity to engage in a conversation with the women leaders on this stage. They are they have excelled in their field and in the field where we need to see more women. So let me introduce them to you quickly. Their bios are in your program. Um, Maria Alvarez is a partner of director and partner director of shared engineering services in the artificial intelligence and research division of Microsoft. Um, uh, Anusha Koch is the Vice President and Distinguished Engineer for Analytics and Architecture at IBM. 
Veronica Nelson is the Executive Director, Advancing Minorities' Interest in Engineering. Dr. Talmisha Richards is the Chief Academic and Diversity Officer, STEM Connector, Million Women Mentors. And finally, Wendy To is the Vice President, Client Success, IBM Watson, and Cloud Platform. These are the women shaping the future. So we're going to engage in a conversation. How cool are all their titles? <laughs> I'm very intimidated, actually, to be sharing the stage with this group. So um, we're going to start with a first question. Because really our objective here is to talk about the experience of women of color in STEM in particular, I want each of our panelists to reflect on their personal journey. Um, and, and in two ways. One, to talk about what drew you to the industry. And secondly, to share with us how important role models or mentors, sponsors were to you as you advanced through your career. And we'll start here with Maria and then we'll move down the line. Thank you, Deborah. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to be here today. Thank you, John, for inviting me. Before I start telling you why am I he I'm here in the technology industry, I want to give you a piece of data, awesome uh, all the stats that you share. Within 2018, within this year, it will be more than a million computing jobs openings. The United States only produces 69% of them. So some of the kids yesterday were talking about international students. Microsoft goes beyond the United States, all over the world, to attract talent. I just came from South Africa, uh, at attracting uh, talent from there. Now, the demand for computers or software development will grow from 28 to 32 percent, um, depending on the type of software industry that you are. Now, within the technology workforce, 25 percent are women. Of those, 3 percent are African American, 1 percent are Latinas. So coming back, why am I here? I am here because of my mom. I'm originally from Valencia, Venezuela, uh, and then I, I wanted to study psychology. So uh, when my mom, when I was graduated, um, I wanted to study. And my mom said, hey, there is a university in our town. They have two majors, business and computer science. You are going to study computer science because that's the future. How she knew more than 30 years ago that that was going to be the future, I don't know. But I was a good girl. So I follow what she said. And I was good at math, and I did pretty well. When I finished um, that, uh, my degree, I basically, all my books were in English, and I, you know, I realized that in order for me to do better, I needed to do a master in computer science. That's how I applied to a fellowship in Canada. So they accepted me, but I didn't know any English. You can tell by my accent. Um, so I went to Los Angeles to the only family I had in the United States. I did a, an ESL program. Um, I studied like crazy. I couldn't, in three months, study English and pass the test. So I lost the scholarship here. Well, these international students at the time is very different now in the current situation. Uh, you can only study or work at the school. So what I did was, I went to the ESL program and I told them, you know what, your system doesn't work well. You don't know how to attract your students and your scores. But I can do that better for you. And I made a proposal. I told them, I will code the whole thing for you for free if you give me an admission for free. And they accepted my offer. I was able to study for free, not only for me, but for my husband. So. Um, you know, move pretty quickly. Um, you know, I, I study. You know, I you know I questioned yesterday about um, supply, demand, or access. I do believe we have a supply problem. You know, as you see, we are not able to produce. But then we have an access problem. Where do we find this talent? I pretty quickly went to um, Symantec. They a question was yesterday. You know, do you, you do you are you here because of how you look like? At the time, I don't think so. I got the job in Semantic because I was a developer and did a computer science degree. Um, 
Um, and then pretty quickly, I, I went to many companies. And today, I'm six and a half years at Microsoft, uh, and supporting you know a whole um, services organization, you know, helping create a more diverse and inclusive culture in Microsoft. Thank you. Thanks so much, Wendy. Good morning. Um, my story starts like most stories do with a girl and a boy. <laughs> now this is going to get interesting. Oh, it is. Um, my parents, I was born in Malaysia. My parents decided to move us to Florida uh, for educational opportunities. So we, we came to Florida and I uh, went to a local high school and we were bused every day. And on the bus was Michael, six foot two, Blonde, blue-eyed, and I had a crush. I was in love. <laughs> and when you're a girl with a crush, what do you do? You talk to the guy, you try to find out what he was interested in, and then you pretend you're interested in what he's interested in. <laughs> Michael, this was back in the early 80s, loved these things called computers. Who the heck knew what computers were back then? Um, and I convinced him to take me to your nearby Radio Shack, where he wrote me my first Hello Wendy program. Ah, <laughs> the memories. Unfortunately, Michael ended up going to the prom with my best friend. Aww. Aww. But I settled for my wonderful parents buying me a $2,500 Radio Shack TRS-80 Model 3. You can Google it or go to a museum. 16K of memory with a cassette drive. 2,500 bucks, guys. So that was probably the beginning of my interest in computers. I learned to play computer games, took computer courses. I went to the University of Florida and double majored in math and comp sci. Yes, see, go Gators, wherever you are. Um, and what was interesting to me, if I take a look back, is comp sci was the emerging uh, you know, choice back at that time. Um, I was always surrounded by majority males in, you know, in my classes. It was the norm. And so when I was recruited and joined IBM as a programmer many, many years ago, and throughout my career, I have always been the woman in the room, or you know, perhaps the minority woman in the room, which in some cases gave me a lot of opportunities. IBM has always been at the forefront of diversity and inclusion. And when I was a young engineer, I, and, and when I first became a manager, I got an opportunity to go to many, to, to go to conferences, to participate in leadership development, um, and, and developed a wonderful network. And as I became more self-aware as a leader, I gave back by being involved in a lot of diversity initiatives, especially on women and, and Asians, as well as underrepresented minorities. Um, so if I take a look back in my journey, you know, I've been fortunate to work with a company that has done uh, a good job around diversity and inclusion. I'm heartened to see some of the progress that we've made, but the reality is some of the conversations we were having 20 some odd years ago we're still having now. So I look forward to kind of talking through that and sharing some of my experiences. And, and I would say that I'm delighted to be here and I look, I look forward to the dialogue. Thank you. Good morning. I am Veronica Nelson, and my journey wasn't planned. I had it, but it was fueled by passion. Passion, teachers who saw something in me that I did not see in myself, mentors, champions, and sponsors. And so I had a desire to for science and, and, and technology. And so I had the opportunity to study engineering. But I did not find out about engineering until my junior year, going from my junior year to my senior year of high school. And so I say that to tell you that it's not too late. And so from there, I was able to go into the engineering career. And my goal was to really move up that technical track. And so I stayed in engineering for 18 years, but I was tapped on the shoulder and asked, they saw my passion and they wanted me to go into engineering management. And so I went into engineering management even though that's not what I really wanted to do. But then I realized that was my passion. My passion was to help others. And so after 20 years in engineering, I had to make a difficult change and move into human resources. And so for me, it was, it was difficult because I was moving out of that STEM career. 
But I realized that it was important for me to move into that position to help others find opportunities across the corporation. And those individuals were often people of color and women who were, who were very frustrated and could not see any movement. And so there was a new position created and I was able to lead it to help individuals find opportunities. And from there I went into university recruiting and I was also had the opportunity to develop university and recruiting strategies to increase diversity in the workforce. And so after 20, 27 years at a corporation, I decided to make another big move. And that was because of mentors. I moved from a large defense contractor to a consulting firm, where I had the opportunity again to develop strategies to increase diversity in the workforce. And all of that journey prepared me to where I am now. And so I, about 14 months ago, I was tapped on the shoulder and asked to apply for this position as executive director of Advancing Minorities, um, Advancing Minorities Interest in Engineering. And it is a, a corporation or a nonprofit organization that really works with government agencies, industries, and historically black colleges and universities. And we develop programs to attract, educate, graduate, and move, and promote and then also place diverse, underrepresented students into engineering careers in the workforce. And so that is my passion and my desire. And so I realized through my entire journey, I was very interested in really changing the, the outcome for underrepresented minorities. And so that's how I did. And you share your story. <laughs> Hi, I'm Anshu. I'm from an immigrant from India. So my story is very interesting. I'm a risk taker. So I grew up in the area of India where there is a lot of terrorism, Jammu and Kashmir, if anybody knows. So I said, you know what, I cannot stay here and be in, you know, we couldn't even in late evening, girls couldn't go out or women couldn't go out. So I said, I need to change my life. And there came a, a scholarship opportunity in Russia. I was 18 at that time. And they said there are engineering and medical students who are going to Russia, and you have to pass the test, and you get into there. And I said, I said, you know what, why not? And my mom is like, you know, I'm talking about 86 and the environment in India. My mom's like, where are you going to go? You don't know language. What is happening? And what are you going to do in engineering? Oh my god, my girl, and all that stuff. <laughs> you know, there comes a rebel. And I know a lot of girls, daughters are rebels, so I have one. So, <laughs> so I said, no, I'm going. And I'm, I, I just wanted to let you know that I'm, I'm applying here. And that was the best decision I have taken in life. And I went to Russia. I studied there in um, uh, MGO, Moscow Gostarshny University. I just uh, found a colleague here um, who's from Sain. And uh, learned Russian, didn't know a word of Russian, then had my uh, dual degree, one in Russian and one in uh, my engineering computer science. Now the good part was now my father is like, OK, what are you going to do there? I said, you know what, I'm going to take computer science. I, we need to change. We need to change the way we live, the way we think. So he said, why don't you take medicine then? I said, no, I'm going to take computer science. And this, is, this will be very hilarious if you relate to um, how uh, that time India was. He said, OK, go. You will sit in a mainframe, uh, this place, and they are air conditioned. Otherwise, it's very hot in Delhi. <laughs> <laughs> that was my story of uh, my getting into computer science, and then it has been a journey, a fantastic journey. But I have been always taking risks. So I finished from there. I went to London, did a job, did a job in one of the companies. Got bored because it was like after every uh, two or three hours, they used to drink tea. Would you like to have some a cup of tea? <laughs> Let's go and have a cup of tea. <laughs> and, then came um, uh, no, nothing against you know institutions in, uh, in London, but it was so. As I said, uh, then I got an opportunity to come here, and I started thinking about the reason I came into computer science. I got the opportunity to do that, and I started writing firmware for, for cell phones. So the, all the cell phones that you have, we started writing firmware for that in Bell Northern Research. So I was a researcher for a while. 
and then went, changed companies, went to GE, went to um, uh, uh, Hughes Network Systems, did network management system there. But at the heart, I always was a technologist and wanted to do something different that will help the mankind, right? At present also, when we are in IBM, I love this company and this is the longest I've been in any company uh, for about 15 years now. Uh, it's, it was about Smarter Planet. It was about how are we going to change the way we do transportation? How are we going to change the uh, people access computing? And so on and so forth. So um, I have been fortunate enough and uh, uh, to uh, be on this journey and be part of this great organization and be a part of this um, this um, amazing changing world with artificial intelligence as Deborah said I was like when she said that uh, you know we don't know robots will be doing everything and I was telling Veronica okay we'll sit on the beach what the hell <laughs> 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 um, so that has been my journey it has been and uh, it has been great thanks Anshu and <laughs> coming to last but good morning everyone Right. Just making sure you're still awake. Um, so my STEM journey began in the third grade. So I'm going to take you back on the journey. Um, so I thought math was, was the spawn of Satan. It was the worst thing in the whole wide world. And there was a teacher who took an interest in me and showed me that math could be fun. Um, and so fast forward a couple months later, I won the school's math beat. And then I won the regional math beat. And then it was time for the Baltimore citywide competition. And I was ready. Um, and so the mother of the reigning champion walked up to me and said, you won't win because you're a girl and you're black. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, mm, yeah, yeah, it was great. Uh, so, you know, I, had, uh, I have a mother um, and a father who instilled an audacious faith in me that I could do anything I put my mind to. So I thought she was crazy. I, I, she didn't know what she was talking about. So I won that competition, and I, um, and then I won the next year and the year after that. <laughs> Little icing on the cake. Um, but I, I say all that to say, um, I fast forward years later, I went to the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, um, earned a degree in chemical engineering and mathematics, um, and then went on to Hopkins Medical School for my PhD. And so, um, in between that time and, and now serving as the Chief Academic and Diversity Officer at STEM Connector, mentors and role models were a key part. Of course, parental support was always important, um, but they also instilled in me the importance of paying it forward um, and a personal responsibility that I feel um, that because there have been so many role models in my life and so many mentors, that I need to be that for someone else. And I would hope that all of you in that room, if you take nothing else from what we say today, that it is your responsibility to pay it forward. Um, I did also want to mention um, my creative path. Um, so when I was in graduate school, I was also an NFL cheerleader. So I cheered um, for three years with the Baltimore Ravens and five years with the Washington Redskins. And I say that to say um, there were many people who thought I shouldn't be a cheerleader because you can't be a cheerleader and a scientist, right? That's weird. Um, but um, little do, I, I guess a lot of people know that there's an organization called Science Cheerleader, which are current and former professional cheerleaders who have STEM backgrounds. Um, we do a lot of mentoring and outreach, and it was through that particular organization that I realized that while I loved research, I had a passion for research, I had a greater passion and calling to do something much bigger and more outward facing. Um, and so that's where um, I landed myself at STEM Connector, being able to connect with executives um, and high level thought leaders from academia, being able to forge relationships and come up with strategies to promote diversity in STEM. And so that's kind of it in a nutshell. Aren't they awesome? <laughs> Veronica, I want to pick up on your several references to the importance of sponsors and being tapped on the shoulder, and it's a theme for almost everyone on the panel. But a question that typically is asked about sponsors is, how do you find them? How do, you, how do they find you? So if you could talk a little bit about your experience to, and speak to that as well so that people understand um, that process, I think it'd be great. Okay, thank you. I want to talk about mentors and sponsors, and we all know the, the difference. And so 
my movements were really due to, or, to mentors. And so when I had to make the difficult decision from moving from one field to another, I had to reach out to my, my, my mentors. Because I, I can tell you right now, I did not want to do it. And so they really had to push me and show, show me the, you know, I needed to think outside the box. And so it was critical. And so when it came to those mentors, I actually selected the mentors. And so many times there are formalized programs that are there. We have formalized programs, but for me, informal programs worked well. And so whether the mentor was um, someone in my direct chain of command, whether it was someone at a different sector, whether it was a male, female, it was really important for me to have diversity in my, in my mentors. I selected my mentors because they helped me professionally, and I admired them. I never selected mentors because they could help me get to the next level. That wasn't the reason why I did that. And I also stepped out and I decided to ask the CFO to be my mentor. Now that was very difficult. Mm -hmm. But I realized she became an amazing sponsor for me doing that. So I reached out to her, we had a meeting. Um, we sat down, it was a business meeting asking me why did I want her to be my mentor, what were my expectations, and then she told me what her expectations were. And so very different, but it was powerful. And so she gave me access to areas in the business that I did not have access to before. And so in that way, she became a sponsor. And then I also had the opportunity to have a, uh, the Vice President of Human Resources was a sponsor. Now sponsors are very hard to come by. And many times, I would say people of color and women of color don't have those sponsors. But I was fortunate late in my career to have sponsors. And so they were able to wear my t-shirt when I wasn't in the room or when a special opportunity came up and they were reorganizing the human resource and, and university recruiting, they decided to put me over that organization. And so, but it was extremely hard to find and many times I had sponsors that I did not know of. Um, and tell me, I mean a big part of your work is the million mentors. Um, tell us a little bit about that and, and what, it, what you're doing. Of course, so uh, Million Women Mentors began just a few years ago. Um, and we set out to build a coalition of one million mentors for girls and women in STEM. And some people thought, oh, a million, that's gonna be hard. No, 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 it's not. So 2.1 million mentors later, um, what we found is that everyone is passionate about getting more women and girls in STEM. And I also do wanna know that over half of those relationships have actually materialized into mentor-mentee relationships. Uh, what we're finding very much about these effective mentor relationships is that there is reciprocal accountability, and I think that's what you were count, uh, um, touching on. Um, you have to go in knowing what the expectations are from each other, um, and also create a safe space where you can respect that particular person's experiences and they can bring it to the table. Because it's easy, quote unquote, for someone to say, all you have to do is this, and fill in the blank. But you don't know what personal challenges that person has faced that makes that all you have to do is this really difficult. Thank you. Um, I'm going to switch gears a little bit, and I'll start with you, Anshu. And I, I'd like you to reflect on um, the importance of inclusive workplace cultures um, and what a role that plays. And just if you could share with us in, um, in your experience some examples you've seen of practices and what companies have done that have really made a difference to create inclusive cultures. No, definitely do. So uh, I think it's important to give an opportunity. There are so amazing women in STEM and all, but sometimes don't get the opportunity. Maybe this, this group of people were fortunate enough to get that opportunity. So I think it's very important to give the opportunity. I, what um, I have seen in companies and have changed a lot of companies who take a conscious decision. Let's see how many of them are in, uh, in uh, STEM. How many of the engineers are there? For example, in Huffington Post recently, no, it was a um, couple of years back, not recently, um, Google had 30% of their workforce was women, but only 17% was STEM. Facebook, 15% was STEM, and this is the heart of California we're talking about, right? In IBM, we have a better ratio, but, um, but we would have liked to have more. So what, uh, what the, it's important first, first point to see what is that ratio there. Next, then have some programs, like I can talk to IBM, we have a pathways program, where we are taking, it's at three levels. Now one size also doesn't fit all, 
right? Mm -hmm. There are various different levels that um, the minority and women are at, so how are you going to grow them in that? For example, we have the top, we have Focus 50, where they are, they, we take the minority and make them distinct, mentor them to become distinguished engineers. And where it's a, it's a tough process, there's a lot of boards you have to go through, and it's important also, I think Angela mentioned this, that does this person look like me? This was interesting, I'll give you my pers personal experience. I was the first Indian woman to become distinguished engineer in IBM. And after that, a lot of Indian women and um, you know, Asian American came to me and said, hey, how did you do it? You know? And you mentor them and you feel so blessed that you have this opportunity to mentor them. I've at present in India three of them, right? So in this very short period of time. So focus 50 for the high, um, then there, there, there's next for the mid-level, we have the advanced technical STEM careers. So we have the ATE, what we call, and we train them. This is, this is a company which has like 350,000 employees and we cover 120 to 25 countries. So the, everybody doesn't get the opportunity what you have if you're, start, if you're working in the United States. So we, there they pick up the um, minority woman and um, actually minority men also, be it Middle East Africa, be it India, be it China, and they train them how to have mentors and train them how to get to that next level. And then there is the newcomers, because you have to retain them. You have to show them the light, right? So how do we have programs in order to take care of that? So these are some of the distinct programs that the companies should look into. And what has, fa this is my personal experience, what has fascinated me about is there is a conference that is Women of Color. I don't know whether, have you been there? Amazing conference. I, I related that to that conference so well that you see these high potential women talking and you can relate to, oh, maybe one day I can become one. Or even Grace Hopper's conference. I think these are some of the things that the corporations have to keep in mind of how to nurture, nurture that um, STEM career with the woman uh, or, or even minority women in their companies. Thanks, Anju. Um, I'm going to turn to Maria, and I want to pick up on your personal story. And you, you talked about, I mean, so powerfully about not having the language skills. And so I'd like you to reflect on the emotional tax research that I talked about um, and what that experience was like for you. Um, and as you've kind of gone through your career, have you continued to experience this feeling of being an other and, and how have you navigated that? Yeah. Yeah, so I learned about emotional tax uh, terminology with, uh, with you. Um, but reflecting back, um, you know, for me, um, it, I, I being very aware of who I am. Um, and what I have done instead of, you know, being a, making that an emotional tax, I have actually played to my advantage. And so what I have, you know, I know that I have an accent, that I mispronounce words. And so I engage people with that. I said, hey, you know, how do you pronounce that? Maybe I'm not saying it right. So people engage with me. But then I, I use that to provide points of view. However, there has been hard times. Um, and I do believe that people um, of color, women, in many cases had been interrupted or over, you know, they, so they say an idea and somebody takes that credit. So we have to stand, and I'll tell you one story uh, that happened to me many years ago. I was working in a company um, that was, um, I'm not gonna say specifically the ethnicity, but it was the majority, the CEO, my boss, all my coworkers were from one ethnicity. I was the only woman, and not to say Latina. And uh, we were in a meeting with the CEO, and the CEO talks, starts talking about Maria, what, what happened? Why you didn't know this stuff? And what I felt there was I was being completely set up for failure. So in the meeting, I stood up and I said, I'm not gonna put up with this and I'm quitting right now. And I left that company forever. Um, you know, and, and then it was very risky. I didn't have another job landing or anything like that. But I just said, I cannot stand for this. 
I have many stories about women that feel um, that they go to meetings, you are the only one there, and immediately they tell you, you take the notes. So I have girls that told me, Maria, you know, the first time, I got it. I took the notes. The second time, it felt awkward. Um, I do it, you know, I did it. The third time, I woke up. I made a statement, a statement that, you know, I'm not the secretary or the admin, why you don't take the notes? So we have many, many stories, you know, that we have. And um, so that we, we have to educate. But I do think that it's important for us to educate um, our coworkers, not only the male uh, coworkers, but also from different ethnicities. And that, I think, is important. Wendy, I'm going to turn to you. And we've talked a lot about how STEM industries are very much male dominated. Um, and in my opening comments, I talked about how important it was for men to play a role. Share with us your perspective on what companies can and should do to engage men to really be champions and our partners um, in moving toward our goals. Yeah, I think this is a really important topic. Um, because back to Maria's point, uh, when you talk about if you're the only woman you're asked to take notes. Well, when you're the only technical woman of color executive in the room when diversity initiatives come up, <laughs> guess who gets to sign up to be the diversity person, right? <laughs> and I'm, I'm beyond that, because diversity and inclusion is the responsibility of all of our leaders, all of our management team, regardless of what company you're at. And Looking back, I've actually partnered very successfully with men, um, technical leaders, who said, we want to achieve an outcome, let's figure out how to do it. And so I'll talk about three elements of a program. Ginny Rometty, our CEO, loves threes, right? I'm sure so. <laughs> three things. The first thing, as you said, is education and engagement of men, especially white men, because they still dominate in US uh, corporate culture, and especially in STEM, uh, at all levels of management and leadership. Many of us get to come to these sorts of things, and we know the statistics, and we know some of the challenges, but most men are not educated. They, they don't understand, they don't know, right, the extent of the challenge. Um, and then I think personal engagement, so education and engagement, what John said, earlier was very true. You've got to personalize it. It can't just be PowerPoints, right? So the more men talk to women or underrepresented minorities in an engaging way that says, I am interested in understanding your experience and how you experience things, they will learn, right? It, it's, it just, it happened literally to me last weekend. I was here in New York with a set of top executives at IBM. And there were three women and one gentleman um, at a table, and, and the gentleman was a very senior executive, and he was a diversity and inclusion expert. And I had been inv uh, invited to this event, and I, I told the ladies, I said, you know, when I got invited to this, I was so excited, great opportunity. Do you know what the first question I had was? I, I, I called up one of my uh, mentors, and they said, what to wear? And I said, yup. And the guy looked at us like, what are you talking about? And we'd explained to him, that as women, when you get invited to events and it says business casual, or you get to an event be at a table you've never been at, business casual for men, pretty much, you know what the standard is, your khaki pants, your shirt, and then a jacket. <laughs> what is business casual for women? Right, see men don't even think that we spend energy thinking about things like that. <laughs> but it is important when you bring women to the table, Right to explain, you know, to have that conversation. It really is. So I think education and engagement. Um, the second part is what I call mentoring and reverse mentoring. Right, like men have got to have a vested relationship and specific talent for women, for underrepresented minorities, and they need to have that reverse mentoring of understanding what the women are experiencing and what we can teach them in terms of our experiences. And I tell people mentoring is a lot like dating, except you can have multiple partners, okay? <laughs> you cannot just match people up. You really can't just have, you know, oh, you're both, you know, from the Washington area, or you're a woman and you're a woman. Yeah. You really need to have chemistry. So for mentoring programs to work as Veronica said, sometimes it's self-selecting. Sometimes you have to try out mentoring relationships, and if they don't work, 
because the chemistry is not quite there, you gotta move on. And that has to happen on both sides. So I would say, if you, you know, as corporations look to put in place formal mentoring programs, you've got to recognize there needs to be chemistry, right? And that both sides have to say, all right, this is working or this is not working, and there should be a mechanism to address that. And then the last element um, is, you know, is really about a programmatic approach, right? When I partnered with Dave Linquist and Mike Kaczmarski, I'm sure you might know them, we said, look, in this particular part of the world we're in, we do not have any women at this level, this technical leadership. So we are going to do a set of things <coughs> over a period of 12 to 18 months, and the business outcome we want is that these women are going to be promoted, not because they were in the program, but because the program we put in place will prepare them to be very competitive. And so we were programmatic about it, we measured outcomes, and we held people accountable. We, and, and part of the elements was you bring people to the table. What do I mean by that? You bring them to the informal meetings, you get them committee assignments, you get them to shadow you so they can see how discussions are made, so they can forge the relationships, right? You gotta look programmatically at recognition. Um, I was recently presenting at an all hands where you know we recognize you know and I and I would, had just joined this group. I was the only woman speaker, and that was noticed by the women in the audience. But we're going through recognition. You know, you pictures up. These people agree. There were six total PowerPoint charts. It wasn't until the sixth page that the first woman appeared. I will bet you most of the guys did not notice. I will bet you, actually I know a lot of women noticed because I got the comments and the feedback we got. You know, we had four or five main themes. One of them was, hey, it's nice to see a woman out there. And number two, why didn't we see any women in recognition? And I'll tell you that even as recently as two years ago, when I joined an organization again, it's part of the organization where I was the only woman senior executive at the table. They had monthly wall of fame recognitions. Again, the first thing I noticed was there were no women. Now these have been going on for years, but the men just did not notice. It wasn't, you know. So when you need the programmatic approach, you need to hold people accountable um, to for the business outcomes, but also for raising their awareness that symbols matter, roles matter, it sends an unspoken message to the women, especially the women who are attracting the earlier career women, and you may be disenfranchising that whole constituent without even realizing it. Thanks so much. I mean, part of your comments, you know, I reflect on John earlier this morning said how, the question came up, how do we define inclusion? And we often say inclusion is really hard to define in many ways. Exclusion, you feel it. Um, and your story of you feel it instantly. You see it, you recognize it. So I will you say that, heads from yeah, at IBM, we are really focusing beyond diversity into inclusion, and, and, and we define it as I believe, I belong, I matter, right? So those are the three aspects. That's what we want to infuse our organization with for everybody. I'm going to open up now to the audience for some questions. And there was a question that came in from the audience yesterday, so I'll start there while folks raise their hands. And, and the audience question was, how do we address the double standard that women face in leadership positions, and how do we talk about them? So would anyone like to start? I don't know whose question it was. But I'll, I'll start with that. Um, I would say it all goes back to empathy. Um, and John talked about it earlier, is realizing that everyone's experience is slightly different. Um, and that's not your reality, but at least listen and have an understanding um, and gain that perspective so that you can be that person's advocate in the room. I would say, um, go ahead. Yes. So I think he, he talks about Transforming. So we are. We need to transform the culture of the company and the organization. Specifically in my case, even I have a privilege, which is I am the only one in the room. 
So I can make a difference when we're talking about talent uh, promotion and advancement and engagement. So expanding for that. And I believe we also need to get men to do that more. And um, we are advocates for promoting women and, um, and, you know, and recognizing them. That's one of the things that um, I would do. I would say I think everyone, and women leaders included in management, have to recognize that there is a confidence gap. When I work with male employees versus female employees, the male employees come, they, they ask, they have no problems asking, they are very, um, they are very confident about their successes and their talents and abilities, sometimes perhaps more confident than I might be. But the women who are equally as talented come in from a confidence gap. They second guess themselves, they say, oh, am I, can I really compete, am I really ready for this? So I think when you think about the standards, I think you have to understand, you gotta make sure that you let women know you believe in them and you have confidence in them. And I think you've got to make sure that we, not you, right? I say we collectively, because women are just, we can fall into some of the implicit bias, you know, lenses as well. But we have to make sure we're not judging women by a higher standard or a different standard. And I will tell you that the, the last year, it was a huge challenge as I saw how the presidential race was covered. And I, I took a look at that and look at a microcosm of how women are treated and expected. And I'll, I'll share with you um, that we have heard feedback informally that Jimmy Lometti is treated differently because She's a woman CEO, even though she's a leader of, you know, a, a Fortune 500 company. So, that's yeah, and I have her. Actually, I have a comment here. I agree totally. I think women second guess themselves. I'll give you my very simple example. You know, even though I'm a risk taker and all that stuff, blah blah blah. And <laughs> <laughs> I remember when I was got, I, I mean, one of the um, vice presidents or in the states. She's, she's now retired. Um, she came to me with a couple of clients. And then she came back and she said, you know what, Anshu, I'm, I want you to lead the architecture for technical sales in IBM. Lead all the architects. And this was a huge group. I said, oh no, Lauren, how can I do this? Oh, it's such a huge, big job. I cannot do this. She said, okay, go, think, and come back. So I'm thinking about it, oh no, I, you know, I, this is such a huge job. I, am I prepared? Am I not prepared? And then, then she called me. She said, I remember these words, Missy, you get chance once. You take it or leave it. I remember those words, and I always remember that. That you get your chance once, you take it or leave it. Uh, questions from the audience? Okay. I see a couple hands back here. Just, hi, go ahead. Um, my name is Min Almadi, and I'm, uh, I work in We started talking about forming coalitions with female researchers, professors, um, and AI is a big thing, it's everywhere, and there aren't not many female researchers working in AI. And it really needs, we feel, a female perspective. So what are the things that you're working on uh, that reflects more of female leadership participation in who wants to start? I, I can start. There's an interesting, the, you brought up a very good point. Um, there's this organization which IBM actually supports, uh, Girls Can Code. And I was in one of the hackathons of Girls Can Code, and these are high school girls who come, and the, um, the um, hackathon that was the topic of the hackathon was AI. It was building a chat bar um, using Watson. And it was amazing to see how fast these girls absorbed everything and they are writing chatbots and all that and indexing and doing all the work that data needs to get prepared in order for artificial intelligence. So these kind of things are very important because it's not about us here. It's about the next generation that is coming and how we are going to make this whole thing cool so that it's, it's 
Everybody wants to come to this field. There's this huge perce perception, I go a lot to schools, oh, coding, it's boring, you have to just sit in front of a computer, it's not cool. We have to change that with what is happening, as you said, with artificial intelligence, with what we are doing in cloud, what we are doing in the various different uh, sections. So I would say reach out to me so I can connect you with all the brilliant women doing research on our Watson technologies and um, if you, quantum computing, IBM is researching that and we've had some breakthrough. I'll tell you guys, when Watson won Jeopardy, my husband accused IBM of um, creating Skynet, right, in the Terminator. I will tell you that, you know, five, six, seven years later, unfortunately, I think he's right. I, IBM will be at the forefront of creating Skynet. It's kind of scary. I hope I'm no longer around, but um, it, it is so exciting, artificial intelligence. I, there are a lot of issues around that, not just around the technology, but around the ethics and the morality, and just because we can, should we? Um, but I will tell you, if you say you're finding, I having problems finding women in that research, we'll connect you with the researchers at IBM. And let me, let me. Okay. I did, and I just wanted to add, it, it's critical, we talked about it earlier about access. And so we're excited to work with IBM, corporations like IBM and Oracle, and they have free resources that are out there that we can share with K through 12. So it's really important for us to do that. And so when, we, when we're in the inner city and they don't have access at their schools, we want to thank companies like IBM and Oracle for giving us access to those tools and we can share those resources with K through 12 programs across the country. So let me tell you about what we're doing. We're doing a lot. Microsoft, actually, the technology won parity on speech. So we are, um, you know, able to create uh, the technology that works better than humans. We are, we have a lot of women in research. I'm happy to connect you with that. We have multiple programs at, across all levels. Starting with high school, we have programs that, um, you know, for women in data science uh, um, degrees. Also, we have programs for military, for people that want to change careers, and we have apprenticeships for them to come to Microsoft. We have AI school for our employees. We have uh, working you know, with other companies in um, ethics. So um, it is you know, the future, and um, you know, we have tons of programs, and we need more diversity. Why? Because if you, call and say, Google, um, you know, translator, and you say, he's a doctor, or she's a doctor, or what is a doctor, what is it gonna be translated to? It's gonna be translated, and he's a doctor. And who is the, the you know, care for the, for the family? She is. So there are biases on that, and we need to ensure that the people that we have enough diversity, so our algorithms are not bias. So more important, we need communities uh, to, to join. So happy to connect you with uh, many of the programs that we have. Thanks. There was another question back here. Well, thanks for the inspiring panel. It's uh, very helpful. So currently, I'm the director of membership and programs from One to World. Uh, this is also my first time leading my own team in my career. So I'm uh, interested to know um, what challenges do you have as a female leader managing white Americans or as a manager with a minority background? And if, if there's some advice you could share with us. Thanks. Who wants to start? I can start. Okay. Oh, Maria, then on you. Um, so what I do is by, um, I am a servant leader. So what I tell people and my team is, I'm here for you, I work for you. If you are successful, then I'm successful. So then we eliminate the threat that you have, who is she, what she doing, all this stuff. And then I engage on trust, earning their trust, complementing um, you know, the strengths, playing to the strengths of the team, um, and then getting the best of my employees. So that's some of the things that I do um, today that has played uh, pretty well. Um, and then he sends a um, uh, sense of uh, collaboration, and then uh, we are winning together. Um, that will be my main, you know, I have other tips, but that will be my main, like, leaving others to talk. So before Anshu answers, I'm going to say, 
my first boss taught me what he called the Vidal Sassoon theory of management. This is going to date myself. <laughs> if you don't look good, we don't look good. So, aren't you? Go ahead. <laughs> I think Maria said it very well. I think it's all about gaining trust and putting your foot down. You have to be a leader rather than a manager. People who are leaders, they follow them. They don't follow managers. So give, do what is the right for the team, for the right for the company. It will all follow along. I would say constructive criticism. Um, you know, of course, combining positive with the negative. Um, and just more than anything, going back to what all the panel panelists are saying here, is gaining trust. Um, because you'll be able to collectively come up with those innovative ideas and progress. When I first became a manager, um, I was early in my career. As an Asian um, woman, I was socialized to be seen but not heard. This is the Asian culture, right? You, you always want to be um, part of the community and that you had to respect your elders. So that was the background I came from, right? You conform, you respect your elders. So now you take on a management role where you have to be a manager and a leader to speak up. You'd have to deal with conflict, which very much from an Asian culture I didn't like. And you had to manage people who were much older than you, right? So part of what I had to do was I had to almost play a persona. I had to make sure, I had to number one, understood where I was coming from. I had experienced managers to mentor me, and I would, you know, all the things everyone said here is, is, is right, and, and right on earned the trust, but I think, you know, if for, for you, if this is your first time, make sure you have a manager, an experienced manager, make sure you role play the worst case situations, really, and then give yourself the confidence. You would not be in this position if your boss didn't have confidence in you. So as you become a manager, you can deal with your employees, build their trust, deal with them firmly and fairly. Okay. And just one thing, I want to get to know your team. And so as a new leader, sometimes it's important to do what I call new leader assimilation. And so get the feedback from your team, find out what their, their concerns and their fears. And so sometimes that's a little hard to take because you'll find out some things that you're not, you don't want to hear, but I think it's important. And so you find out what their, their fears are, and then you also find out what their strengths and their weaknesses are. And if you set up your team that way, then you'll have a successful team. We have time for one more question. Okay. Sorry, and I saw you first, so you get to go. Hi, um, my name is uh, Lori Chen. I'm with uh, JP Morgan. So thanks for all the panelists for sharing your story, which I can relate to quite a bit, because I came here as an international student uh, from Taiwan and study and actually got into uh, become financial advisor, which, you know, if you see the movies, it's a uh, very wide dominated, uh, Caucasian dominated, I guess. So I was given nicknames in the early of my career in the office and whatnot. And everywhere I go, um, I was always the only and younger, youngest Asian woman in the room. So uh, I would say throughout my career, it's been very difficult for me to find a male mentor, uh, actually female mentors, I'm sorry. Uh, all my mentors and sponsors who you know, has been helping me in the last 16 years has always been uh, male. So I don't know what your comments on that and why. And also when I uh, attend another convention that's focusing on Asian American, um, there was a talk about how you should uh, in particular pick a white male as your sponsor. So I want to hear what your comments on that. I think it's, it's hard to find a female because there are, are not many at that level. And so you talked about women of color. And so I had the opportunity to attend the conference and I've been going since 2007. And so I looked outside my corporation because sometimes I did not see individuals at the top. And so I selected mentors from other corporations. And so you, sometimes you need to look outside of your, your corporation and look for individuals, especially conferences where it's focused on women. Yeah, and, and um, um, yeah. <laughs> contact me when, when before I leave. There is actually, this is very interesting, there is a bond club. There's a woman bond club in New York where it is all the woman executive, very high level executives who work on Wall Street and I'm part of the kind of that woman bond club where we mentor 
upcoming uh, girls who are coming up the uh, career in finance, in IT, and all that stuff. And it was started was interesting when I ho when I asked them, how did you bond woman bond club? What is the name and how did you get started? It was on the premises of about 30 years ago that there were a lot of women, but they were not getting the respect that they were demanding from Wall Street. So they started this club, and it has grown now quite a bit. So I'll connect you to some of the top um, women um, analysts and so on. And so on. Thanks, so maybe one more. There was a question here, thanks. Um, I know today we talked a lot about uh, the obstacles and challenges for women uh, to be in the tax sectors. Um, but in some cases, um, do you feel like the women, as a women of color, maybe sometimes your identity will be your advantage as well? Since, you know, as the women uh, leader in tax sectors, sometimes you receive more public attention. For example, like the um, CEO of uh, face Facebook, uh, Cheryl, I think she has a book, Leading, and uh, maybe receiving more public attention. And like the Chinese scientist, Li Fei also, right now she is the uh, uh, leading the Google AI team in China. So I'm not sure in your career um, whether you feel sometimes your identity as women, um, as women of color, sometimes give you the advantage as well. Yeah, well, I think I'll, I'll comment on that because absolutely, I, I feel early in my career when you know they rolled out diversity programs, Corpa did, and the management team had to say, hey, I'm going to pick a nominee for the Women of Color Conference. And they look around and they're like, yeah, pretty much. That's the, the only one of color. She gets, she gets it, right? Now, the great news is I took opportunity, advan advantage of the opportunity. So yes, absolutely, I do think you get opportunities to get nominated to come to conferences like this. Um, I will say that being a woman and getting attention not all attention is good attention, right? If you take a look at Cheryl Sam, I mean, she wrote Lean In. There was a lot of attention, but there was a lot of criticism as well. Um, so I do think being a woman at the table gives you some opportunities. It gives you a set of challenges, and it gives you a responsibility. You know, for us who have been in STEM as STEM was evolving, we need to make it an easier place for women to advance for the women coming into STEM today. Anyone want to add on to that? Of course. Tasha. So uh, you, are, you are uniquely you. There's only one of you. Um, and, and as such, you bring a very unique perspective to the table. So you have to embrace that and have confidence in yourself and your ideas to bring those to the table. Because at the end of the day, we all know that diversity makes us stronger. So, you know, end all be all. Be confident. Be confident. So thank you, everyone. I just want to say, I mean, if you listened, uh, for me listening to this conversation, this group of amazing women busted every stereotype about women in leadership, taking chances, seizing opportunities, standing up for yourself, being confident, going into positions that are traditionally where we don't see women, and particularly we don't see women of color. Nothing has ever stood in your way. And I think for everyone listening, men and women, your careers and stories are exceptionally inspiring. We need more of you, so thank you for sharing with all of us today. Another thing is that woman, John has started this 50 Outstanding Asian Americans, and I was very thrilled. John, you had a lot of women there. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>